We are displaced by Malala Yousafzai. Jennifer, I needed to do something. My heart burst with pride and love on Marie Claire's graduation day. She was the first in her family to finish high school. This was a milestone for all of them, second to their arrival in Lancaster six months earlier. Her graduation was a symbol of what was possible. Her family was so thrilled when she received her diploma that they began hollering in the otherwise quiet crowd. After the ceremony, they threw her up in the air, cheering. Other families looked at us as if we were crazy, but I didn't care. I just thought you could not possibly understand what this achievement means to this family. In 2015, I was visiting my daughter to celebrate my granddaughter's first birthday and reveling in the joy of being a grandmother when I saw the photo of a Turkish police officer carrying the limp body of a three-year-old Syrian boy out of the Aegean Sea. It struck me to my core. I read that the boy's father, Abdullah Kurdi, was the only one in his family to survive. He, his wife, and two children had made it out of Syria and into Turkey, when they paid smugglers to take them across the Aegean Sea to Greece, but their boat capsized just on the Turkish coast. As I read about the thousands of refugees fleeing Syria, I realized this was the biggest humanitarian crisis in my lifetime, and that I needed to do something. That same day, I googled refugee and volunteer and found Church World Service, CWS, a faith-based organization that had a resettlement program in my own community, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It was the first time I had ever heard of it. When I returned home after helping my daughter, we had a little family discussion. I worked full-time, my husband travels for work, and we had two teenage boys at home. I knew that if I was going to start volunteering, my family had to be on board. My children knew this might mean that they didn't get the newest iPhone because a family we were helping might need groceries. Everyone agreed this was important. They each wanted to get involved. Marie Claire and her family were the first refugees we were matched with when we started to volunteer that same month. All I knew was that they were being resettled from Zambia and were originally from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, DRC. I did not know yet that they had spent three years fleeing the Congolese war, literally on the run from violence. They finally made it to the neighboring Zambia, where they spent many years, much of that time, living in refugee camps before getting asylum in the United States. I couldn't speak to them before they arrived, and I wanted to understand as much as I could the circumstances they were fleeing, so I did my own research. That was how I learned that the Congolese war, an extension of the lethal tensions between Tutsi and Hutus, and Rwanda that spilled into the DRC in the early 1990s were responsible for the deaths of approximately 5 million people. That's more than the entire population of New Zealand. Over 4 million are internally displaced and there are approximately 445,000 DRC refugees in other nations. Learning the numbers and the history was not the same as understanding, but it did help me fill in some of the blanks. My job was to meet them at the airport, drive them to their new home, and help get them settled. I took a vacation day from work because their arrival was in the middle of the week. My husband was in Texas and my kids were in school, so it was only me and a few other CWS volunteers. When I first met the family at the airport, I was shocked by how thin most of them were. They were a group of 14 people, including Papa, who was 61, his wife, Uera, Marie Claire's stepmother, and then their blended family, including Marie Claire, her sister, Nidina, 21, their brother, Amor, his wife, and their three children, ages 9, 5, and 2. The kids especially looked so emaciated and sickly that I was concerned, and yet they had all dressed in their best outfits, the men in slacks and dress shirts, the women in colorful African dresses with their hair either wrapped in matching scarves or done in elaborate braids with beads. When I complimented them, Nadina said we wanted to make a good impression on our new country. Marie Claire was extremely shy and cautious. She barely looked at me when she said hello. As we drove to their new home, which the CWS found for them in a lower-income part of Lancaster, the family stayed quiet in the back, taking it all in. Meanwhile, I had a sinking feeling as I drove past houses that needed paint or had a sagging porch or had litter in the street. I wondered what the family was thinking. And then Nadina said, Oh, this is so beautiful! I was relieved to hear hope and enthusiasm in her voice. We pulled up to the four-story City Row house, and I took a deep breath. As we walked through the building, I took note of things that needed to be fixed, like the hole in the kitchen ceiling from the leaky bathroom above, and the scuffed walls in real need to be of paint. None of the windows had screens, and the small backyard was overgrown with weeds. There was only one bathroom for fourteen people, and the windows in the attic did not open. 
What if there was a fire and they had to get out? Meanwhile, Marie Claire's family saw none of the flaws I was worried about. They loved the house. They were completely overjoyed. In Zambia, they didn't have running water, let alone their own bathroom. They lit their homes with candles. They were overwhelmed, in fact, by how big the house was. I immediately understood the extent of my privilege. Where I saw so many problems, they saw opportunities. I showed the women how to use the stove and refrigerator, since they had never seen either. I also showed everyone how to use the toilet and shower, while the kids ran up and down the stairs and fought over who got which of the five rooms. I learned that it was the first time anyone had ever been on an airplane, and that no one had eaten in two days because the airline food was so foreign to them. It was hard for me to leave them that day. They were overwhelmed, and I didn't know how else to help. I invited them to come to my house for dinner that weekend. After giving them a tour of my home, Nadina and several others kept saying, You have so much water! At first I was confused, but then I realized they were referring to our faucets. They were still floored that you could turn on the spigot and water would just appear. They had one bathroom in their new house, and I have several. It blew their minds. I learned that in Zambia they had to walk three days to get water. On another afternoon visit, I made popcorn. They all gathered in front of the microwave in awe. They thought it was magic. They asked me to do it again, and all pulled chairs and stools around the microwave to watch. Everything was new and delightful to them. It was a blessing to see my life through their eyes. Marie Claire opened up slowly, and I began to see her determination. She made it clear that she wanted to go to an American high school, even though she was almost 19 and already older than most seniors. Administrators at our local high school were not sure she could handle it. They were concerned that her studies in Zambia would not align with the coursework here, plus her English was basic. Marie Claire said to the admissions officer, Take a chance and believe in me, and he must have seen the same determination that I saw, because he did. I was nervous when Marie Claire started school that January. My son went to the local public high school and had a difficult time making friends his freshman year, but Marie Claire was not concerned with making friends or joining any clubs or teams. She was laser focused on her education and spent all her spare time studying and going to her English tutor. I know now that Marie Claire will likely succeed in anything she does because of that focus. She manifests realities for herself. As much as Marie Claire and her family truly celebrate life, I've witnessed very low moments too. I bought Marie Claire and Adina necklaces as a gift. I wanted to give them something special that they could cherish. I also wanted them to have something they could wear always, to know that I was there for them, no matter what. They were so moved that they started crying, sitting on my couch. At first I thought they were happy tears, but I soon saw that my gift had touched a deep well of sadness in each of them. I asked them what was wrong. Marie Claire spoke first. This is such a beautiful thing, all of this, being here with you in the United States, but I just wish our mother were here to experience this with us. They rarely talked about their mother, Fiora, but I knew by then the circumstances around her death, and I knew that both girls had witnessed it. She sacrificed her life so that we could have this life. Nadina could barely say the words. She was crying so hard. The pain I felt in my chest that day must be heartbreak. I wished their mother were there, too. I wished she could see what brave, strong, kind, determined, beautiful girl she had raised. But I also know that their mother's spirit carries on in each of her children, especially Marie Claire. She is unstoppable. She must get her determination and her moxie from her mother, as well as her tremendous sense of humility. That deep grief is something the girls carry around with them. For every amazing accomplishment, their happiness is weighed down by the very real trauma that got them here. I imagine this is true for all refugees. The paradox of being grateful for a new life that is based on the painful loss of an old one. Marie Claire referenced that pain when Malala invited her to speak during the youth session of the UN General Assembly in September 2017. I was in New York for the event and got to sit on the General Assembly's floor beaming proudly as Marie Claire shared her experience with a distinguished crowd of world leaders and diplomats, including the President of France, Emmanuel Macron. Marie Claire looked calm and confident as she stood on that podium. Then she started to tell her story. One night, armed rebels broke into our house with the intent to take a life. We watched as our mother was killed. She sacrificed herself to protect me and my siblings. At this point in her speech, you could have heard a pin drop. Then, more than ever, I wished her mom were still alive to see her daughter capture the attention of this entire crowd. 
But of course, that is the irony. Marie Claire was there at the UN because of her mother's love and sacrifice. Furora should have also been the one to drive Marie Claire to college, so watch her settle on nursing as her major. She should have been at Nadina's wedding. She married another refugee she met in Zambia who had landed in Utah. They reconnected, and we were all in the wedding, party and procession, another highlight. Now, whenever I am with Marie Claire or any of her siblings, they introduce me as their American mom. I feel privileged and honored to have each of them in my life. The pride I feel in that title is at times overwhelming. When Marie Claire arrived in America, she was so reserved and cautious, but I saw a spark inside her that was just waiting to become a blaze. With her, it really was an evolution. She was always focused and determined, but I've watched as she grew more confident with support and encouragement. She not only embraces opportunities, but manifests them. Only three short years ago, this young woman had an uncertain future. Now she's fearless and unstoppable, making a real impact on the world. She ultimately wants to return to Zambia as a nurse and activist to help other refugees. I know she will. End of part two. Jennifer, I needed to do something.